Welcome to The Facts That Matter. I'm Erin Wilson. Today, I wanna to share four facts with you about designs in physical security. First, I wanna welcome Mohammed Shazad, professional in designing physical security spaces. Welcome, Mohammed. Thank you, Erin, for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Now, let's get to the facts. It's a fact that effective building security requires a methodical, layered approach. It's a fact that effective physical security should be designed per a design basis threat analysis and not on assumptions or individual experiences. It's a fact that effective physical security combines deterrence, barriers, intrusion detection, mechanical locks, access control systems, and video surveillance systems. It's a fact that 68% of workers globally do not feel completely safe in their workplace. Now for some questions. Since effective building security requires a methodical and layered approach, what does a building manager or owner need to think about or do when it comes to designing physical security for their facility? Yeah, so I think you laid out the facts uh, in, a, in a good, you know, nice order. And one of the biggest important aspects is how do those solutions mitigate their risk? Um, so for that, they have to understand um, that the solutions they're deploying are not just uh, solutions for the sake of um, uh, implementing an access control system or intrusion system, but do they actually meet their uh, functional and operational risk? Do they actually mitigate that? Uh, do they meet the objectives and requirement of the, that the actual facility has? But more importantly also, how is the operation and the function of that space done? Uh, what is the user experience? What is the uh, user uh, movement flow in the facility? Uh, what is it that they're trying to accomplish uh, from an operational standpoint? Um, and then uh, designing, as you said, not to the individual experience, but to actual layered approach, methodical approach, and having it done uh, from a perspective uh, of objectives, a uh, perspective of best practices. Uh, and so therefore, it's really important when people are looking and thinking of protecting the facility that they're not designing around systems and technologies, uh, because that can limit your focus and, and eliminate some of the necessary elements of operational needs, functional requirements, uh, design and performance criteria uh, that you really need to give yourself flexibility around to, to provide the right layers, provide the right operational uh, workflow, and actually really properly mitigate the solution. And then the last other thing I, I want to mention in that is that um, any effective building control that is going to be sustainable uh, does require uh, proper engagement uh, with leadership. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more when we get to the last fact as to why uh, people don't safe, feel safe in their workplace. But, you know, has leadership been engaged? Has the program been articulated, communicated? Uh, what is it that they're trying to accomplish? How are they going to execute that? Uh, what is going to be the change management plan around it. And so those are some of the elements that building owners, managers, security directors, and, and practitioners should really take into account as to whatever they're designing is centered around a performative criteria that seeks to mitigate the risks of that facility, but most importantly, also the risks that that particular business has from an operational function standpoint. Okay, so yeah, a lot of people get hung up and they want to design around some kind of security system, but then they they don't have then they're unhappy because the building doesn't function properly. So when designing uh, with using the the design basis threat analysis, what exactly does that mean, and what does it include? So. There are, there are multiple aspects to it. So let's just kind of break that down. Uh, the first and foremost is determine the objectives and the functional requirements you're trying to uh, design around and not the system itself or what you have in the physical constraints. Um, so identify what the needs are, identify what the objectives are and operational objectives, because whether it's a camera system, intrusion system, a barrier, a turnstile, a bollard, they're all trying to achieve uh, a, a functional operational objective, which is a, you know, unauthorized people who shouldn't be in your space should not be able to get into your space. And if they do, what is the fastest, most efficient way to manage that incident? So 
identify what the objectives of the design criteria are and identify the objectives of security. Um, what are the different attributes and characteristics of that particular technology, a particular solution that you're looking for? What does it offer? Um, and then evaluate um, how uh, that particular solution matches up against your environment. Um, so that's smaller details. Where do these things are going to go? Uh, if it's ballers, where they belong? What are the best angles? Uh, are you able to create an environmental design aspect? Are you able to blend them into the aesthetics of the space if it's access control or cameras and the right spaces? Uh, you're not having to compromise line of sight. Uh, what are the characteristics of those cameras, for example? What are the characteristics of the sensors? Um, where are they being, where are they going to be placed? So all these things uh, that, that need to be added to it, you want to, want to look at it holistically. And then you want to evaluate that if you do this layered approach, is it going to actually mitigate that, that functional risk requirement that we just identified in your first question? Once you have done that, um, a lot of times, you know, the system is in place, but the SOPs around it hasn't been hasn't been finalized. They're coming like a reactive as a day two almost. Uh, now that we have bought the system or designed the system, now let's figure out how we're going to operate and manage it. And I kind of feel like that that almost has to be done up front. So now you want to combine people, process, technology, which we kind of talked about, in into the whatever is the delay, deter, delay, uh, and response uh, element. You have your technology, but what are the people around it that are managing it from a system administration standpoint, project management standpoint, change management standpoint? Uh, what are the procedures in order to sustain that system, run and manage that system? Uh, but what are also the procedures to evolve with it uh, from a, from a uh, process standpoint, communication standpoint, escalation standpoint? And how are you combining those three elements to the central objective? First, proactive, which is deterrence, uh, being able to give yourself enough time to respond in terms of delay and um, then be able to respond effectively. Uh, and that you know, includes not just managing the incident, but also being able to escalate, communicate, follow through, uh, and, and create a true incident management plan. So those are some of the elements that uh, really should be included holistically when you're starting to have discussions around what the design process looks like, around what your requirements are. Uh, and, and frankly, what are your limitations? Do you have enough people to manage a system that may be too complex? Uh, so do you need to go to, to a more efficient solution or you have the right, right uh, staffing uh, power, but do you have infrastructure, uh, background, supporting services, cross-functional support from other departments? Uh, so all those things, uh, all those things go into, uh, into the design site based analysis. Yeah, you mentioned reactive, and unfortunately, too many things are reactive where oh, something happens and owners like, oh, we've got to do something to, to eliminate that, that threat. So designing physical security, that really needs to be the whole thing, the, the processes, the SOP, the people, all of that. Owners really need to start thinking about that when they're coming up with their, their project conception. And way back in the beginning, they can't just add it somewhere in the middle or the end because then all of those things, the processes, the people, is it the right item? Is it the right uh, place? Is it the right, does it allow for the intended function and purpose of the building? So owners really need to start thinking about this way early in the design process. Yeah, oftentimes security is thought of as, you know, not last minute, that's just kind of, but still not in that, uh, immediate when we're designing, when we're thinking uh, of space planning, when we're thinking of identifying where do we want to be, where do we want to build, uh, you want to take all the, not just the physical risk factors of that location, but you want to take into account your organization, uh, your employees, your visitors, people that are entering that facility. Uh, what do they do? Um, what type of cultural change it in introduces? Uh, what is acceptable level of risk? Uh, what is not acceptable level of risk? Uh, what you know? What are you trying to be proactive about? Uh, and what are you trying to uh, get to as quickly as possible um, during an incident? And all of those combine, uh, as as we mentioned, people, process, technology, and what type of people do we have from 
decision makers to stakeholders, leadership, down to practitioners, administrators, tactical staff, responders, all those things uh, come into account. And once you have the holistic picture, you, there's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of tools out there uh, that you can utilize to have an effective layered approach uh, for your for your facility. And if you're also if you have the process in place, especially the communication escalation process, everybody's aware of what what risks are, and you can you can really engage your population, your leadership, into mitigating them on a regular, continual basis. So the the layered approach with the deterrence, barriers, delaying the intrusion detection, locks, access control, what makes them most effective? Um, I think the the most important uh, uh, parts are take into account what your physical environment looks like. Um, so are you know are the you're starting from your perimeter, you're walking uh, inwards. Um, are bollards going to work? Are barriers going to be effective in that environment? Uh, do they um, do they create a situation where it's going to be a non-starter day one, or it's going to be ineffective because uh, the procedures of vehicular entry or pedestrian entry are just going to basically allow people to say, oh, we're just going to bypass this because it doesn't operationally work for us. So as again, as I said, system for the sake of system, a barrier for the sake of barrier doesn't work. Uh, if you're going to put, uh, for example, guard booths, are they going to be staffed? If they're not going to be staffed, do you have the right type of um, technology around them to be able to proactively operate and manage them. Um, also, um, you know, places are dynamic. Um, so you may have thought that this is going to be a staffed station and two years down the road, the nature of the facility has changed, suddenly it's not. So now what is the change management process uh, in place? Have you thought through, have you basically developed contingencies so now you can give yourself the flexibility of managing and changing situations. Uh, what if your facility has a lot of events that happen and hundreds of people show up? Uh, what is your process around that? So really understanding what the facility looks like and what type of acceptable contingencies and change management plan that you have, I think that's the most important thing. Um, second thing is, does the technology, and I'm going to talk a little bit more on the technical side, does it actually work in your environment? Um, you know, there's solutions out there, with, you know, from the standard of access control and video to the more advanced and sophisticated of frictionless uh, or analytics. Or uh, uh, It's really important to validate uh, that those layers are going to work in your environment. Uh, does your infrastructure support those technologies, the processing behind them? Um, do you have the staffing to be able to analyze um, and evaluate the results of those technologies. Um, are you able to? Are you creating more work for you without not without having without having insufficient staff to do that, uh, or you're relying too much on it? Um, and now you're basically creating an environment where it could be false positives or a false sense of security, uh, false negatives. So it's really important that when when you design those layers, you really look through the lens of how the operation of that facility. Uh, functions, uh, who are the people that are involved with it, uh, what is your change management process, because that facility's function is going to evolve, and you have to evolve with it. So you want to make sure you have built in enough contingencies, and that doesn't mean you've flooded the, uh, every place with multiple cameras and redundancies like that, but you know you have taken into account for that. So whether it's from an infrastructure standpoint, from a people standpoint, process standpoint, that you, you accounted for how you would evolve with that uh, with that facility. The last thing I want to mention in this particular area uh, is really uh, awareness. Uh, what is uh, what have you done in order uh, to communicate effectively first to your leadership and to your stakeholders uh, that this approach is going to mitigate risks in which way? And do you understand how the user experience of, of that particular approach looks like. So if you're creating too many barriers and your employees are basically going to uh, not accept it, is that going to create a problem where now your security uh, measures uh, are not are, are ineffective? So you really want to understand and make sure that the nature of the work, if it's, a, you know, if it's an open accessible building, what does, what does having multiple layers in the perimeter side uh, uh, do to that accessibility? 
Um, and I'm not suggesting that you should, you know, you should completely acquiesce to it or ignore it. Finding uh, the balance between what is the intended nature and what is the user experience of that of that location really impacts heavily uh, into the acceptance of the security program. Because ultimately, what you're trying to do is that once again, you're not designing to a system. Um, you're designing to uh, create a culture of safety, culture of security, where people proactively think of it and proactively participate in it. Majority of your of, of your security and safety comes from the culture that's around it. So you want to design solutions. You want to add layers that people understand the reasoning behind it. Most people, once you explain what the elements of security are with the nature, they're not going to fight against it. So that's really, really important to make sure that you're not designed something that's going to be rejected by leadership because they don't want a guard booth, they don't want a barrier out there, it takes too much long, the queue is too long for visitors to get in, et cetera. So you want to account for those things, but at the same time, you want to design something that really incorporates um, um, the culture of your organization. And they also understand the value of security. And that's why risk conversation around risk is really important. Uh, so where we've seen security departments engaged um, with uh, leadership, with user groups, um, uh, communicate risk effectively, they're able to create really robust security plans. They're able to deploy advanced technologies as well as layers of security and effectively manage them. Yes, because if it's if it's too complicated, if it's too intrusive, mm -hmm. then people will find ways to bypass it and then it's worthless after that. And mm -hmm. with that, and 68% of workers globally not feeling safe in their workplaces, uh, we've discussed a lot of this, but what else can building owners do to change those feelings or perceptions? So one thing I wanted to add in the last question was a lot of times security departments themselves don't use uh, half the security features, just turn things off. You know, the, the shunting of the alarm because, oh, it's just, I you've designed a system that has, uh, you know, thousands of alarms coming in because you have connected every input and every door contact and every door sensor and your command center has one person on a midnight shift and they're just shunting the 2004, you know, held open alarms that are coming in. So a lot of times, even, even within security, which is not even non-security stakeholders, uh, they will ignore certain events and incidents because the system is designed uh, for a maximizing effect of security, not taking into account the capacity limitations of how they're being managed. Uh, so now, you know, now we have AI coming in trying to help with that. Uh, but again, do you have the right resources that understand and are able to analyze that AI? So a lot of times security itself uh, kind of just bypasses half the controls because they're like, you know, this was designed 10 years ago. I don't know what they were thinking back then. And I'm just, we just don't do things that way. So I think it does not, I think it's important to understand that it's, uh, it's human nature also to be able to do things more efficiently. So if you design something that's complicated or too uh, complex, people will, will try to find a way to bypass it. Uh, but with that, you know, I think the, to your last question, engagement uh I'll always come back to engagement is really really critical um and another important thing is understanding user experience which is the thread of this conversation we we're talking about this that if people find it inconvenient um and or if people find that it it you know takes them away from getting to their desk or getting to their location fast enough they're going to resist it and that's that's a right response. Um, we don't want to be stuck in uh, queues at a grocery store or at an airport for too long. So we shouldn't expect that our employees should be just totally fine with an inconvenient process. And that actually lessens uh, uh, the security and safety of that facility. So engagement is extremely important. Um, the really effective security groups uh, do a really good job of uh, consistent engagement with their leadership explaining and articulating what their program's intentions are, what are they trying to achieve, what risks they're trying to solve. Uh, they engage really well with user groups, um, um, you know, new technologies when they're about to send them or, or deploy them. Uh, they will do focus groups. Uh, they will do a showcase or a showroom uh, where they can bring people in and, and explain. And that doesn't mean you have to tell them everything, but something that involves an element of user experience, uh, engagement becomes super important. Proof of concept from an end user standpoint, I think are vital for anything that you're trying to do new 
or you're trying to uh, accomplish uh, from a security and safety standpoint. Test it. Test it in your environment. Test it with a large group of people, not just security stakeholders, uh, because they will have all kinds of concerns. It's too high. The height is not good enough. Uh, I'm having to take in my badge out in this way. Um, aesthetics. Um, so piloting, testing, proofing also uh, gives everybody enough time to get used to what you're trying to do. And you'll be surprised that a lot of times the results are, oh, this is great because it allows me um, to get through faster or it makes me feel safer. Um, uh, or this is great, but can we add this feature or can we do it a little bit differently? Now they have a stake in the game. So once again, not every single employee needs to be part of this process. But if you have done uh, a good enough exercise of engagement, uh, there are security organizations that do a very good job of uh, engagement with their community by doing campaigns, um, you know, once a quarter uh, luncheon or hosting a barbecue in summer. And these are all efforts that really allow people to engage with their security groups and really explain or uh, articulate what concerns they have. And it also helps the security groups learn. It also helps build a relationship uh, so that people know that, hey, if something happens, my security department or my security group is going to be there for me. And if they're implementing something new, they're going to take my input or they understand what the user experience is. They understand what the employee uh, safety concerns are. So I think that engagement uh, at all levels, if you're going down uh, a technology solution and your leadership doesn't understand what it does, you're, you're not going to succeed. Uh, similarly, if you have not taken into account what the user experience of those employees is going to be coming in and out, the visitors are going to be coming in and out, uh, it's going to become ineffective. Uh, so really understanding both sides, being able to explain uh, what we're trying to accomplish, what are our risks, and how we can mitigate those, uh, usually we see those become, uh, that's when your number starts to go up in terms of uh, feeling safe and secure. So the key seems to be communicate and engage to make sure that everybody, all the users, visitors, stakeholders, understand how it works and if it works for them and, and what issues they see or run into that is intrusive or complicated or annoying. So for all that matters, what matters the most? Um, I think that understanding true risk and finding solutions that mitigate that risk. Um, that is the most important thing that you do not go ahead and just buy the latest um, that somebody's trying to sell you and put it in and then try to force it into the function of your organization. Um, so understanding what your true risk is, what is the acceptable level of risk? Um, you're not going to close the facility down 100%. So understanding really that and finding in people, process, and technology, and I think that's another important thing, especially as, as more sophisticated solutions are coming out. Oh, you can solve your identity and access management needs with a PIAM. That's great, but that requires change management. That requires managed services. That requires multiple cross-functional departmental um, collaboration. If any of those links break, the chain breaks. Uh, so you understand what the risk is. You understand uh, what kind of risk identity and access management is ex exposing your organization to. And if I go down the solution, do I have all the right pieces in place from a people process technology standpoint to be able to effectively mitigate that risk and manage that risk uh, and sustain that mitigation uh, downstream? So I have spent $2 million, but now I don't have people to manage it. And the system broke after a year or two years and we're back to square one. So I think that's really, really important. Um, second thing that I would say is a lot of times, solutions already exist in your space. Um, so look at what you have before you go and implement something that's going to be new. Leverage existing infrastructure, people, resources um, to be able to see what's there and that you are utilizing your systems and utilizing your processes and SOPs and procedures in the most optimal and efficient way. Um, so looking at that internal evaluation of your security program 
uh, before you go out and purchase more capital, purchase more, invest in more technology. That's always very important. And that's that matters a lot because that can also show that you've invested in the right thing. So I think if you were to you know do the approach of understanding the risk and then deploying the right solutions and then adding. Uh, the element of let me make sure that I've leveraged everything in the right optimal way and I continue to do that audit on a regular basis, that will really sustain uh, uh, an efficient and very effective program. Sometimes it can be just as simple as simply locking the door. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes it's just that simple. But, you know, uh, you talked about perceived threats and every time something happens, then everybody's like, oh, that could happen here. And it may or may not be true, but they need to understand what the the actual threats, the actual risks are of doing something or not doing something. So really owners, developers, security, they need to really start thinking about um, how their building's supposed to function, what are their potential risks, what are their actual risk? What have they run into in the past? And use that and engage all their users so that they have the right stuff. Just throwing everything at it. Mm-hmm. You throw everything at it, then it's too complicated. Nobody can get in the parking lot because they have to go through the barrier. And then they can't get in the building because they got to stand in line. Then they can't get in the elevator because they got to stand in line. Um, so it has to be usable and functional but still there. And sometimes that security is not visible. People seem to think that if they can see it, then they're safer. But sometimes if you can't see it, you're safer. Any final thoughts before we go? Um, I think that anytime you look at security, you have to look at it holistically. Um, And, um, you know, you mentioned something interesting that, you know, people see, oh, let's just, Let's just go and is that door even locked or not? And uh, a lot of times the solution would be to lock the door. But what are the what are the down downstream effects of looking at any solution, simple or or large, uh, and how does that stay effective in the long term? So from a holistic design standpoint, holistic approach standpoint, you want to look at the totality of your security program. Uh, and when you're especially making larger, large decisions, new technology, new deployment, uh, new building facility, uh, new governance plan, you want to make sure that you have addressed the, all the elements of people, process technology, but also, as we kind of mentioned, what is my deterrence plan? What is my response plan? What is my incident management plan? What is my change management plan? I think change management is so crucial um, uh, in our industry to understand how does the decision that I'm making today impact all the operational and functional uh, effects downstream to my staffing level, to my communication escalation level, to my incident management level. Um, so holistically looking at everything, and that it sounds very cumbersome, but it actually isn't, especially once you have developed a program and you've identified all the right stakeholders, you have a good governance plan in place, it's actually a very easy process. It's you know it's simple three four checkpoints. Uh, we're making this decision. Um, does it work for our, in our environment? What are the interdependencies from a people standpoint? We need what processes do we have? Do we have something that already works within the organization? Um, how does it accomplish our risk? It's four or five points that you can really lay down each time, and then you proof it, you test it, you make sure it works in the environment. User experience is maintained. Uh, you have. You have communicated to the right people. So a holistic approach every single time, looking at all the aspects of what I'm about to invest in is gonna have the right impact downstream long-term. I think that's really kind of my closing thought uh, in each time you're looking to uh, implement a a security design approach. Yeah, some some great information and and it's not just about the security, it's about the, the whole holistic everything how you manage it, how you use it, uh, the processes for and the reasons behind it and making sure that everything works and that it works for that building, that function, that space, and that everybody understands that. So um, thanks again, Mohammed. Uh, great conversation. Yeah, no, it was my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. 
I'm Erin Wilson, and thanks for joining us on another discussion about the facts that matter. Remember, subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell to be alerted to new episodes of the facts that matter.